Good evening. If I could ask you all to take your seats, please, we'd like to start the program. I'd like to call this very historic gathering to order. We've been waiting a long time to see all of you in the flesh, and I'm deeply grateful that so many of you answered the call. I'd like to especially thank Margot Nishimura for her um, talent and energy uh, in organizing this first ever Fellows Reunion. And I want to thank all of the 19 former fellows who served on our advisory committee planning the weekend. As usual, I'd also like to thank the hardworking admin office of the JCB, Maureen, Leah, Elaine, and um, especially Val Andrews, who for many, many years has been the point person that so many fellows deal with during their two or three or four or nine months in Providence. Is Val here in the audience? Well, she's probably back at the office um, guiding a fellow towards, towards us. Um, we have in our midst uh, several board members, uh, Artie Joukowsky, uh, Bill Twadell near him, um, David Rumsey's on his way from the airport, and I'd especially like to single out a retiring member of our board and the latest in a long line of members of her family who've provided extraordinary leadership to this institution and who in fact created this institution, Angela Brown Fisher. Angela, can you give us a wave? And, Next to her are her cousins, uh, Anne and Henry Browning. Welcome also. Uh, we have Brown faculty, and we're always mindful that we benefit immensely, both from our administrative independence and also from our proximity and indeed our inseparability from this great university. I'd like to especially thank Gordon Wood for what he does for us on a daily basis. Uh, he's the chair of our faculty liaison group, so in fact he has um, officiated over the meetings that selected many of our recent fellows. Um, I'd like to thank all of the Brown faculty who serve on that committee and also the faculty here from other institutions who have made Providence a second home because of the JCB, including Jim Muldoon and a former fellow from 1969, Jack Green. And I'd like to uh, uh, express particular gratitude to two people. Um, Poe Adams, the widow of Tom Adams, who was the librarian in 1962 when the first fellows made their way to Providence, and Norman Firing, under whose leadership so many of you came here. Uh, Norman is in the back. Norman, can you, can you wave? Thank you. And there's another group of people who are absolutely essential to the success of this fellowship program, uh, namely the people who pay for it. Uh, Stephanie Walker from the National Endowment for the Humanities came all the way up from Washington. Stephanie, where are, are you? Thank you, Stephanie Walker. And all the NEH fellows, I hope you'll say thanks to yourselves. Um, Joe Mizell, the Deputy Provost of Brown, can't be with us tonight. He's in Princeton meeting with the next president of Brown University, but he was for many years uh, at the Mellon Foundation, and so he, he shepherded, uh, he and his foundation shepherded significant grants to us for this program as well. And uh, I think it's a sign of how much he thinks of the program that he ended up at Brown University. Two days ago, um, I don't have to tell the people in this audience, I probably would in most audiences, we uh, experienced an astronomical phenomenon of great rarity, a transit of Venus, much like the one that thrilled the world of scholarship on June 3rd, 1769. Throughout the British and French empire, scientists fanned out to observe and correlate <clears throat> their observations of the sun. It was a particularly crucial time here in Providence, then competing with Newport, to be named as the site of Rhode Island College, the future Brown University. All of the resources of this city, significantly smaller than Newport, were put into the observation. A telescope was brought in from London. The leaders of this city, including all of the Browns, contributed resources, and the result was a perfect scientific experiment that helped establish Providence's reputation as a city of ambitious thinking and contributed to the uh, successful campaign to bring Brown University here. I'm tempted, but will not give in to temptation, to say that it's been all downhill ever since. <clears throat> this is a city of very steep hills. Um, but I will say that this gathering represents one of the most impressive gatherings in Providence since then. Through June of 2012, we've received in the JCB since 1962, 733 fellows. And of that number, 131 of you have returned for this weekend. 
You represent countries ranging from Argentina and Chile to Canada in this hemisphere, most of Western Europe, Australia, India, Japan, New Zealand, Poland, and Russia. And I just met a few minutes ago our senior most fellow, I think we can call him the senior fellow, uh, Charlie Clark from the class of 1964 to five. Charlie, can you, can you wave to us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's an exciting moment that I hope we will not wait 50 years to repeat. Among other initiatives, I'd like to seize this chance to think about ways we can all stay in touch with each other much more frequently long after the short period of the fellowship is over. I'd like to ask you now to think seriously uh, about ways we might improve the program with the uh, astonishing new tools and technologies uh, at our fingertips and bring those suggestions to a final plenary meeting Saturday afternoon in which we will really try to plan the future of the fellowship program. I'd like to especially encourage former fellows to think of themselves as alumni of the JCB and to come back either in person or online as they increasingly are able to do for researches on later projects. Um, we are all keenly conscious of tradition we are historians, but we're also mindful that this is a time of great change and great opportunity. Last Tuesday, the new JCB website went live, and I hope you'll look at it and uh, let us know if you have criticisms of it. Uh, tomorrow, we will unveil a new site dedicated to our uh, magnificent Peruvian collection. Over the last two years, approximately 4,023 books have been scanned with a total of 537,466 pages. Of those books, um, we, can, we can't count how many hits we've had to our website, but we can count how many downloads. A significant uh, way of measuring the use of our books online, because someone took the time to uh, hit a button and, and take an entire book in, from our, our site into their laptop, and no fewer than 167,589 downloads have been counted, many of them from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we are live streaming many of the events of, of, of this weekend, and increasingly we can keep track with each other in, in real time so that fellows in South America and the Caribbean will be watching the proceedings of this, this uh, conference and sending their correlations and their criticisms afterwards, I'm sure, in much the way that the scientists in 1769 reported back to London and Paris. Upcoming projects include a major effort to digitize our Brazilian holdings and a project supported by Google to support the pres preservation of works relating to indigenous languages. Um, together, these tools are allowing us to consult more extensively and to publish more quickly without waiting the traditional time we have waited in the past for a journal article or a monograph to appear. And yet we still publish in a time-honored way and nothing speaks more eloquently about the mission of this program than the very impressive table groaning under the weight of all the fellows' books uh, in the Macmillan Reading Room, which I urge you to look at over the, over the weekend. Uh, among other outcomes of this conference, I'd like to ask you all for concrete suggestions about how to put these tools to our service as a single community, whether we might create an alumni network of former fellows and what that would look like. Um, I also want to make two brief announcements. If the weather holds, we'd like to take a photograph of all returning former fellows immediately after this, this uh, lecture, and uh, there will not be Q&A after Professor Bailon's talk. At nearly the exact time as the observations of the 1769 transit of Venus, a member of the Brown family, Nicholas Brown Sr., bought a work of American history, Samuel Sewell's Phenomena Quitum Apocalyptica, the 1727 Boston edition, uh, we, and he signed it. And that's in the collection to this day. We traditionally date the origins of the JCB to 1846, which is a year we know that John Carter Brown undertook um, a very serious investment in books coming over from, from Europe. But we might just as easily look to the 1769 purchase as the beginning of the Brown family's uh, extraordinary investment in history. Even before the American Revolution, the Browns were trying to answer a seminal question that we still ask of ourselves. What are we all doing here? <clears throat> that question stimulated the young imagination of John Carter Brown, who dedicated most of his energies to assembling this collection. He bought huge quantities of books and with a capacious intent to include all of the nations and peoples of this hemisphere in his definition of Americana, the word chiseled into the building's pediment. 
It was a capacious collection in other ways as well. Beginning in 1865, its holdings were published for the outside world, and scholars were always permitted to use it. At the beginning, luminaries like George Bancroft, William Prescott, Albert Gallatin, who arrived here uh, as a young immigrant from Switzerland at the time of the American Revolution, and for whom many of these books described events that he had, in fact, lived through. And then over time, the numbers of visiting scholars grew. In 1904, when the building was dedicated, Robert Hale Ives Goddard said, thither will come from many lands the historical student to drink deep from the springs of truth and knowledge which will flow perennially from this spot. It's almost as if he knew that the water tables rise precariously close to the basement levels of the JCB. But no concrete plan for a fellowship program existed until another extraordinary gathering of specialists held here in 1960 formulated a set of recommendations. Number one, renovate the basement. Number two, improve the catalog. And finally, at number six, quote, it was proposed that a series of library fellows be invited in order to bring a variety of scholars to work in the collection. <clears throat> the first two fellows, Lloyd Brown and Joyce Ransom, arrived 50 years ago in the fall of 1962. There were still, however, a few kinks to work out. In the Associates uh, Bulletin of that year, Joyce's topic was listed as New England thought at the end of the seventh century. But it was a beginning, and the rest, as they say, is history. In 1960, the JCB, already well over a century old, um, convened that extraordinary conference. One of the scholars invited was Bernard Balin, already well known for his work on New England merchants and education. Since then, we all know what he has done for the cause of early American history. He's the author of books too nu numerous to mention in their entirety here but which include The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, which won the Pulitzer and Bancroft Prizes in 1968, The Ordeal of Thomas Hutchinson, which won the 1975 National Book Award, Voyagers to the West, which won the Pulitzer in 1987. In addition to being a historian of the economic and political processes that led to independence, he's also a historian of immigration and the Atlantic world. His book, Atlantic History, Concepts and Contours, is one of the essential statements on that subject. He's also a special friend of this institution in the long line of Harvard-trained historians who spent time here, including not only Bancroft and Prescott, but Samuel Elliott Morrison, Perry Miller, with whom he studied. In addition to attending the 1960 conference, he gave the keynote address at the 1991 dedication of the Casperson Wing. Only a few minutes ago, he asked me where the Casperson Wing was, because despite having dedicated it, he wasn't sure if he'd ever visited it. I, don't, I still don't think we have. It was only about 10 feet from, from us when you asked. Um, as he pointed out to me, this is almost an alumni gathering for him as well, since so many of you have attended his international seminar on the Atlantic world. For all of these reasons, it's a great privilege to welcome back the Adams University Professor Emeritus at Harvard University, Bernard Balin. Thank you. footnote to what Ted just said. Uh, he didn't uh, tip his hand earlier. Uh, he's right about my relation with uh, um, the JCB. I have a very warm, uh, sentimental, I guess, relationship since one of my first publications many, many, many years ago. Uh, had to do with the Brown family of Rhode Island. Uh, it was a review of uh, the first volume of James Hedge's History of the Business Enterprises of the Brown family. And it is a fascinating story of uh, the family, which goes continuously for four centuries. Uh, and I'll say more about those continuities later, but they first appeared in New England, the Browns, in 1638. And they followed Roger Williams, being Baptists, they followed Roger Williams to what the Puritans called the latrine of New England, <laughs> the cesspool of vile heresies 
and irreligions. And there in Rhode Island, the Browns for three generations served not as merchants, but as leaders of the Baptist church, as land surveyors, distributors, and community leaders. It's only in the fourth generation, you have to think in generation terms. When you talk about the Browns, I'll say a little more about that too. It was in the fourth generation, in the early 18th century, that the family began its ascent as shopkeepers and traders, merchants, ultimately manufacturers, bankers, and financiers. Originally unsophisticated local and coastal traders, without contact with the well-established networks of transatlantic trade, they made their way slowly and cautiously very close to their humble, pious roots. Now, the first of the brown merchants, James, in the middle of the 18th century, wrote characteristically to a Connecticut correspondent, quote, please to get tan horses that is suitable to go to Sure Nam and bring them down next Monday come fortnight. While his younger brother Obadiah wrote from the Caribbean that he, quote, could not do what you sent me for, that is, to get money. <laughs> well, within a generation, they learned how to get money, and lots of it. And under Obadiah's direction, who was a very shrewd character, they nourished their profits into a small fortune, grew bolder, more imaginative, more entrepreneurial, and on the eve of the revolution, the family firm, now directed by James' son, Nicholas, was deep in every kind of commerce. They were major iron producers, they were dominant in the production and distribution of spermaceti candles, they were in a perfect position to profit by the opportunities, legal and illegal, that suddenly appeared with the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. And so like so many other provincial traders, otherwise unheard of, the Cabots, the Appletons, the Higginsons in Boston, the Astors in New York, the Girards in Philadelphia, they turned to supplying food, goods, shipping for the Revolutionary Army and Navy, developing in the process major Atlantic enterprise they flourished as wartime financiers, and they ended up men of very substantial wealth. At his death in 1791, James' son Nicholas owned close to $200,000 in public securities, in addition to his real estate shipping goods in hand and the valuable objects he had collected principally books. Just when book collecting became the Stem family's principal avocation is not known. But as early as 1740, Nicholas Brown, age 11, inscribed his name in a book that is still owned by the library. And in the years that followed, he and his siblings and children continued to collect randomly books, quote, Dear, at that time, the JCB's great librarian Lawrence Roth wrote, Dear, at that time, to the amateur, fine copies of Greek and Latin classics, sumptuous editions of celebrated works of literature, books notable for their copper plate illustrations and other productions of that sort that filled the dreams of the bibliomaniacs of that period. That's a quote, it's not me. <laughs> By the early 19th century, the Browns had created a large and valuable gentleman's library, but without any larger purpose in mind. Then in 1846, the first of three distinct phases in the life cycle of what would become the JCB began. In that year, Nicholas Brown, 
the third of that name, sold his extensive collection to his brother, John Carter Brown. Now, I have to pause to say something um, peculiar about the Browns. And if members of the family are here, I hope they'll take this in good part. <laughs> they have been, anybody knows, wonderfully successful, generous, public-spirited family, but they have had one minor failing. They have had no nomenclatural imagination. <laughs> they settled on certain names early on and rarely budged. <laughs> the three Nicholases in the family's stem line form an unbroken succession that lasted for 130 years, after which there were two generations of John Nicholas Browns, which is not exactly a daring departure, <laughs> a succession that lasted for 118 years, after which they fled back to the safety of another Nicholas, the fourth of that name. His brother, the late John Carter Brown, in our time, the director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, who died five years ago or so, was the second of that name. And his son, who is with us, is also called John Carter Brown. In any case, it was the first John Carter Brown, I'll give you the dates, 1797 to 1874, who had bought the collection uh, from his brother, who turned away from the traditional collecting to concentrate on Americana. A species of publications, Lawrence Roth wrote, quote, largely made up of homely little pamphlets and volumes of utilitarian purpose. The casualness and eclecticism of John Carter's earliest avocation then shifted at that point to a concentrated, focused, relentless search for Americana at which he was enormously successful. With the peculiar passion typical of enraptured collectors, large and small, he bought when and how he could in the open markets, from friends, at auctions, and through agents, quote, after I had made up my mind, he wrote, to go on with the acquisition of books on American history, I should not think that I ever lost a book I wanted. And I have met in competition with Russian princes and collectors from all parts of the world. What he didn't say is that he had the advantage of a zealous agent operating in London, a strange Vermonter by the name of Henry Stevens, who deserves a special place in the history of the JCB. He was energetic and shrewd in keeping the Browns aware of works that came up in the European markets, and more significantly, those that did not but that were, in fact, available privately. But Stevens was, as I say, a very peculiar man. A recent graduate of Yale, he wrote his name, inscribed his name, on the books, the title pages of the books he bought, and then followed it by mysterious initials the meaning of which he alone understood. A few of these private self-identifications have been decoded, and they are revealing. One, the most common, was GMB. He would write, Henry Stevens, GMB. 
and that means Green Mountain Boy. <laughs> Another set of initials, PSBY, is Patriarch of Skull and Bones of Yale. <laughs> but my favorite is BBAC, which means blackballed at the Athenaeum Club. <laughs> <laughs> but odd as he was, Stevens was invaluable to the Browns as they built up their collection of books, pamphlets, manuscripts, and maps related to the Western Hemisphere. In this first cycle of the JCB's life, its birth and infant years, the library was a wealthy gentleman's personal collection of some 7,000 volumes, all of them kept in the Browns' Providence House under the family's guardianship. And it remained that way, a private and personal thing, when it was inherited by John Carter Brown's son, John Nicholas, died 1900, who not only enhanced the collection, but transformed it. His imagination, wealth, filial loyalty, and public spirit led to a second major turn in the library's history. Faithful to his father's passion for Americana, John Nicholas decided to bring the family's unique library out of its private setting and into the public at large by relocating the books from the family's house to a new building, a library building of its own to which, in which the house to house the family's treasure and where it would be kept under professional management. He personally endowed the construction and future maintenance of the building, which is this building. And then, beyond all of that, he authorized his trustees after his death to donate the entire collection and all the associated property to Brown University, but to maintain the library's own independent management, distinct from that of the university. In 1904, four years after his death, his dream was realized when this building was opened for use. Or not this building, but the JCB building. Uh, thereafter, the library was no longer a private possession, but a semi-public institution, an affiliate of the university, in effect, the university's rare book library, like the Houghton Library at Harvard, or the Clements Library in Ann Arbor, open upon request to qualified scholars who could get to Providence for research, and its staff, and its staff uh, uh, was to protect the collection, add to it, and begin cataloging. It was a major transforming development, and to honor the occasion of its completion, a proper ceremony was held in the building, and it was a great event, full of oratory and symbolism. After an introductory address by a trustee of both the library and the university, Frederick Jackson Turner delivered a lengthy discourse, which is a very peculiar essay. Officially, it's on the historical library in the university world, but in fact, it's a laudation of the Brown family, of the library, this library, and the importance of historical scholarship. But it is curious. It's permeated with the then popular idea of the library as a humanist's scientific laboratory with documents and books as specimens, and with the belief that historical study had widened vastly, quote, with the conquests which civilization has made and is still making over the remote continents. Turner concluded with the thought that in the great change, changes and challenges of the 20th century that lie ahead, 
History is a safeguard for conservatism and wisdom. Revolutions, he wrote, may come, and men may dream of reorganizing the world on some new theory. But the past is so stubborn a thing that much of it flows back in the old channels. History, he ended with, history is the minister of conservative reform. The Bishop of Rhode Island then blessed the whole proceedings uh, and the most recent John Nicholas Brown, the second of that name, age four, who later inherited both his father's and his uncle's fortunes. This John Nicholas Brown, age four, presented the keys of the building to the president of the university. That night at a dinner at the university club, eight more speeches were delivered, one of them by the library's first great director, George Parker Winship. And so the JCB emerged into its second phase as a semi-public scholar's rare book library in Americana associated with but not fully controlled by Brown University, and so it remained for the next half century. Then, as Ted indicated, in 1961, at a conference on the future of the library, it was proposed, quote, that a series of library fellows be created on a short-term basis in order to bring a variety of scholars to work in the collections. They would be resident fellows. And when, with the support of a separate endowment, that program was enacted, the JCB reached its present form. With scholars in residence for longer or shorter periods, the library would become a hub, a center of advanced research for the study of the Americas. The first two fellows arrived in 1962, and they have been followed in the 50 years to the present by 718 more scholars. My figures differ from Ted's because he included the present fellows, after all my calculations, <laughs> from all over the world, probing every twist and turn of the history of the Americas before 1800. The list of fellows is, is remarkable. In the fields I'm familiar with, it includes many graduate students, who are now formidable, well-established scholars. It includes two bibliographers, genealogists, and a stray admiral interested in 18th century hydrography. And it includes some of the most accomplished senior scholars of worldwide reputation. David Quinn, for example, one of the first resident fellows from Ireland and Britain. Horst Peachmann from Germany, Jose Carlos Chiamante from Argentina. Their goals differed. The materials they used at the JCB differed. And the character of their scholarship followed different traditions. But they had something profound in common with their work here, which in one way or another, in larger or smaller scope, has been characteristic of much of the scholarship recently and increasingly pursued at the JCB. All three, in different ways, were intent on demonstrating and analyzing the broader reaches of the early American world, the way the Americas connected with Europe and Africa, the way two old worlds as the geographer Meinig put it, two old worlds encountered each other, were both transformed, and became integrated into a single new world. For Quinn, the great discovery, worked out in part at the JCB, was the parallel between British settlements in Ireland and America the common identity of the major figures responsible for the British settlements that formed in his mind a great geographical arc 
swinging west and south from Britain into borderlands inhabited by equally barbarous people. Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New England, the Chesapeake and the Caribbean. In Quinn's three visits to the JCB between 1963 and 1983, he worked on the earliest New England voyages, on the Roanoke voyages, and at the same time on the English conquerors in Ireland. He produced many books based on this, but in the end summarized it in a book entitled Ireland and America, Their Early Associations. Jose Carlos Yarmante's work over many decades has concentrated on comparative constitutional history and the history of political ideas, for all of which the JCB was the perfect archive. Here he did not confine himself to his original subject area, Argentina, but explored the similarities and differences between Latin American, North American, and European thinkers, and the common thread which has always interested him of natural law, which in one way or another, all of these areas of thinkers shared. In 2001, too, his topic stated at the JCB was federalism, comparative study of the independent movements in North America and Ibero-America. For Peachman, years of research on the commercial connections between Europe, America, and Africa had made clear to him that there had existed a pan-Atlantic world after 1580, and as he wrote in a summary in 2002, quote, Atlantic history thus becomes a connecting element between European, North American, Caribbean, Latin American, and West African history. All of Peachman's work at the JCB was inspired by his belief that, in his words, Atlantic history as a historical subdiscipline between European and global history can no longer be denied, and not merely in commerce and government. His work at the JCB in 2001-2 was devoted to, quote, the European Enlightenment and the Bourbon reforms in Spain and New Spain. Similar connections are found increasingly in the 700 plus topics listed by graduate students, as well as such scholars as Quinn, Peachman, and Charmante. The shift is striking, and let me give you some examples. Uh, early in the history of the JCB, typical topics were the following. I, I picked them from the earliest years. Quote, some of Amerigo Vespucci's navigations and their interpretation. John Allen and the Spirit of Liberty. Richard Maydex, a 16th century English scholar and traveler. The Great Awakening in Northeastern Massachusetts. Early American satire from the beginning to Benjamin Franklin. A study of Vincento Coronelli's Libro dei Globi. A survey of Columbus scholarship, 1966 to 82 a study of three catechisms. I don't know if you get the resonance of that. Beginning in the, 16, in the 1980s and increasingly thereafter, typical topics are different. Quote, the Amerindian body in early modern French perspective. Mathematical networks and navigation in Iberia and Latin America. 
Havana, New York, London, commercial relations and the sugar trade. Slavery and emancipation in the United States, the British West Indies and Haiti. The Jewish and African diasporas in the early colonial world. Or opposition to the British naval impressment in transatlantic perspective the effect of trade and settlement in the new world on the development of the political economy in the Scottish Enlightenment. John Carter Brown's great library of Americana has been put to new uses, not only to display the new world that he assumed his library would do, but to, but to uh, explore the connected world that came together across oceans and continents, a great oceanic regional world full of parallels, <coughs> contrasts, and interactions. Neither the Americas, Europe, and West Africa developed on their own after 1500. What happened in one area profoundly affected what happened elsewhere. Portugal's development of Brazil depended equally on bankers in London and tribal wars in West Africa. The income of absentee plantation owners in Britain depended on New England's fish and produce to feed a population drawn from Africa. Cesare Beccaria's famous pamphlet on crime and punishment, the product of a small intellectual circle in Milan, has had a profound effect, not only in France, but in Boston and in the Rio de la Plata. But such a shift in emphasis, such an expansion in spatial and conceptual terms, that is the way of historical research. It leads us unpredictably in so many ways. It takes so many forms. Research serves so many purposes. We carry it on to fill gaps in our knowledge of a subject, to describe in clear detail areas and events only vaguely glimpsed before, to probe personalities and motives of people in the past in all ways, in some way, to contribute to the understanding of how we came to be the way we are. But historical research, in my view, involves something more. One of the dynamic forces in historical research is the discovery and resolution of apparent conflicts between new or newly revealed data and the established interpretations the explanation of unexpected discoveries which seem strange and anomalous and simply make no sense. In the end, the effort to resolve anomalies lies at the heart of the search for coherence in the random scattered remains of the past. And I would like to conclude with an example one example, a personal episode that involves the creative scholarship of the British historian Peter Laslett, whose important publications some of you, I'm sure, know. And much of all of this is encapsulated in this part of his great career. <coughs> Laslett, <coughs> began his work, he's a near contemporary of ours, Laszlo began his work with an edition of Robert Filmer's Patriarcha, 1638, that key discourse in defense of the royal prerogative based on analogy of politics with extended families under paternal control. Like his later great edition of Locke's two treatises, his work on Filmer, uh, the key work, was a fine piece of scholarship, but it raised for Laslett 
the question of the possible social sources and context for Filmer's ideas. Curious about this, Laslett studied the family structure of Filmer's native, native Kent. And he found, not surprisingly I suppose, he found what he was looking for. Complex, stable families extended vertically through several generations and horizontally across lateral kinships, dominated by a paternal head. It seemed to be the perfect sociological foundation of Filmer's political philosophy, all of which he wrote up in an article called The Gentry of Kent. At that time, I was groping for some purchase on the history of family structure for my little book, Education in the Forming of American Society. Nothing sensible, nothing usable had been written, I discovered, on the history of the American family, and then I spotted Laslett's article on Kent, and I saw the light. I happily used it to justify my argument of the decline of the traditional extended family with its essential educative function destroyed in the wilderness setting. The book was published with grateful acknowledgments of Laslett's discerning scholarship. Then, something unexpected happened. Laslett changed his mind. <laughs> By chance, he came on the remarkably complete population records of two obscure 17th century English towns, Clayworth and Cooknow, reconstructing the family and household structures by techniques borrowed from the French historical demographers, he discovered in these villages the opposite of what he had found in Kent. The families in these unremarkable hamlets were small, four, four and a half people on average, nuclear in structure, single generational, and in no way extended. These were clearly anomalous, discrepant, data. Furthermore, and even more disturbing, the families in these hamlets were highly unstable, or at least highly mobile. He found that 60% of the people listed in one census were missing 10 years later. A finding, he wrote, quote, so surprising that we do not yet know quite what to make of it. These samples, he wrote, may be ordinary enough, but they may be extraordinary. We cannot yet tell. We may never be able to tell, but he soon found out. And the anomaly proved to be creative. If generalized, his new discovery, while it confounded his patriarchal theory, suggested an entirely new interpretation of English social history. So he created a center for the history of population and social structure and commissioned many such studies of household organization in obscure villages throughout England, and he found that his new hypothesis was completely confirmed. In the end, this concept of mobile nuclear families, which among other things refuted the Marxist claims that it was the Industrial Revolution that had destroyed the traditional extended family, this became a major finding, which he expanded at great length in his huge summary volume, Household and Family in Past Time. There, in that vast work, he introduced the subject by showing how new 
and revisionist this nuclear mobile family interpretation was, and how obtuse previous historians had been. To document this, that is, to show how wrong you can be, he cited not his own gentry of Kent, but my education book, <laughs> which he quoted at length. <laughs> but research, as the resolution of anomalies rolls on, and it plays no favorites. Three years later, I came on the manuscript of Lutz Berkner's article, he was a graduate student at Harvard, Lutz Berkner's article, drawn from his dissertation on an Austrian village, Heiden Reichstein, that proved something utterly discrepant with everything that Lazarus had written, both before and after, on the subject. Namely, that families and households in the 18th century had no stable structure at all nuclear or expanded, single or multi-generational. Families and households, Berkner showed, with elaborate awareness of what Laslett had discovered, are living organisms, and they change their size, shape, personnel, and functions according to the phases of their life cycles. They are nuclear at one point, but expanded at another two-generational at one point, three-generational at another. By chance, Laslett was visiting Harvard at the, time, <laughs> at the time I was reading Berkner's manuscript, and I happily, and without comment, showed it to him. Now, I do not know what went through his mind 